Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to present to you the research talk I would be giving at the 15th annual AMCSI meeting, which is held virtually this year. So thank you so much to Michelle and the EMCSI uh, annual conference organizers for extending the invitation. So today I thought I would speak to you about uh, research and provide you with the research update from what we are doing at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Montreal. So my name is Noemi dahan -Oliel and I'm a clinician scientist at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Montreal, Canada as well as an associate professor at McGill University. So I'd like to start my talk actually by saying thank you. Um, thank you very much to the study team. So we'll go through uh, the different projects and I'll acknowledge the different team members for each project, but as well as collaborators on the different research projects from the Shriners Hospital in Canada, but as well as in Greenville, and a colleague as well, Dr. Bonnie Sawatsky from uh, University of British Columbia, with whom uh, we collaborate, and uh, patient representatives, including Francis and Annie, as well as a physical therapist, clinician scientist from Poland, Alicia Fafaro. Uh, children and their families, thank you so much for your continued support and participation. I'd like to acknowledge Muscular Dystrophy Canada, as well as AMCSI. Uh, my research staff at the Shriners, as well as my undergrad and my graduate students. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the research um, funding from uh, the Quebec uh, uh, Research Agency, Health Research Agency, for salary uh, support that they provide me. So now just to give some background, the background of our research program is to improve the clinical interventions of children with AMC using a collaborative approach, which means partnering with clinicians, with other researchers, with youth and their families and community organizations in order to improve uh, clinical interventions. And there's three levels of our research program. The first is to develop collaborations, emphasizing patient engagement in AMC research. Uh, studies have shown that including patients in the process of research makes it that the research is more relevant and more meaningful and also has tremendous potential for sharing the knowledge that uh, comes from research findings. Uh, the second is multifaceted approach to improve clinical inf uh, intervention, so using different approaches to do that. And the last is the development of a research platform to enhance care and establish new therapies for AMC. So what I thought I would do today is go over four of our research projects, two of those that are completed and two that are current, so ongoing. And really the, the gap is what we know is that um, robust scientific studies in rare pediatric conditions are lacking and family-centered research is really starting to be more popular and really very indicated in rare pediatric conditions so that, again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, research can be meaningful and relevant and address the important questions that youth and families have. So I'll quickly provide an overview here of the slide. So the first project on your top left is a multidisciplinary AMC clinic. And I'll, I'll go into greater detail into each of those studies. So we looked at two things. We looked at the demographic and clinical features of the patients that attended this clinic over a certain time period. And we also administered a, a tool to look at family-centeredness as perceived by the families attending the clinic. And uh, patients that attended the clinic were also offered to do bone mineral density. And so under the supervision of Dr. Rauch, uh, those bone density uh, data were collected and analyzed, and so I'll share those results with you. The second project is a project of my master's student, and it's uh, using telerehabilitation, so remote virtual uh, connection to assess and provide an individualized home exercise program for children with AMC. And our findings show that overall the goals were achieved, so that's really exciting. So again, I'll go into more details. Uh, for that. The third is a study that I'm uh, extremely excited about is our registry for children with AMC. And the overall aim for that study is to match the phenotype, which means how the person, how the individual presents themselves physically, their physical traits, 
to their genotype, their genetic uh, makeup, and as well the use of patient report outcomes. So asking patients and families questions about quality of life, about pain, about mobility, about daily activities. Um, and so we'll go into that as well. And the last project I'd like to share with you is the co-development of rehabilitation best practice uh, expert statements um, in these five areas here that are mentioned, bone and muscle function, pain, mobility and daily activities, participation and psychosocial well-being, using uh, stakeholder partnerships. So um, this is a new project that was funded and that we just started a few months ago. And really the significance of this program is that by giving families a voice, by giving people like you a voice, the results of research can improve clinical care and generate new information regarding rare disease, such as arthrogryposis. So we'll go, uh, we'll dive in now, and I'll talk about our first project, which as I mentioned, is our uh, AMC multidisciplinary clinic. So we developed this pamphlet to our patients that come to clinic, and we started this clinic in September, 2016, and we started the research aspects of it in December of that year and we finished collecting our data in May 2019. The clinic of course is ongoing and is usually done over two days and so on the first day there is an assessment by the rehabilitation team that includes physical and occupational therapy. Imaging is done and that can include uh, typically x-ray, can include ultrasound and if clinically indicated bone mineral density. Um, there's a meeting with our research team to propose to our patients uh, a research study or two that are ongoing. And then we can do photos and videos depending on the, the need uh, clinically and for research purposes. On day two, the child, depending on their needs, may meet the upper limb surgeon, the lower limb surgeon, and or the spine surgeon, as well as other specialists that may be involved in the child's care, such as a social worker, a dietitian, uh, and so on. So that's, uh, this is ongoing. The, the multidisciplinary clinic is ongoing. And for the research aspect, I want to share with you that 64 participants had agreed to participate in the project. And this is the breakdown of where these patients came from across Canada. Um, so we have the greater proportion of our participants that came from Ontario and Quebec. Um, and some uh, around 11 that came more from uh, the Western uh, provinces and about eight that came from the Eastern provinces. So this is a breakdown of the different um, clinical and demographic features of the participants. So um, we can see here on the left, the table presents the classification of AMC for the participants of the clinic. Um, most had either myoplasia and distal arthrogryposis, and 15 uh, had other types of arthrogryposis, so mainly syndromes and chromosomal abnormalities or um, conditions that affected the central nervous system, as well as multiple congenital contractures. So we see here that most of our patients, and this is for a total of 64, so 60 out of our 64 had involvement of the lower extremities, so that could have been hips, knees, and feet, and the upper extremity, um, 49 out of the 64. In terms of self-care, we used uh, a classification system here uh, that Dr. Van Bossi had used in the past, and we classified our participants as independent, independent with minimal assistance, or dependent. You see here that for both self-care and mobility, uh, 10 were not included, and that's because they were under the age of two and therefore were not included in these two classifications, as the expectation is that they, they're not uh, yet able to participate in their self-care, so in feeding or dressing, uh, toileting, and for mobility, uh, we use the two-year cutoff as well. And we see that 28 here out of the 54 um, so around half were community ambulators, which means that they could ambulate in the community with no aids, and 22 were non-ambulatory. For the bone uh, density, this was just published, and Dr. Rauch um, uh, really was the leading author for this uh, paper. And uh, what we found here is that the lumbar spine aerial bone mineral density was decreased overall in our participants. However, once we normalized those results 
um, and adjusted for bone size, uh, what we found is that the trabecular and cortical volumetric bone mineral density at the radius were normal. And so what this shows us is that there is a low area bone mineral density in the group. However, that reflects smaller bone size. And so clinically what this means, what this data shows is that there is no suggestion for uh, ongoing monitoring of bone mineral density in, uh, in general in this population. Of course, if there's clinical uh, features or factors that may affect bone mineral density, such as frequent fractures or fractures at birth, for example, then of course, bone mineral density should be done. So as mentioned earlier, we used a questionnaire that was developed by a research team in Ontario at McMaster's, and it's called the Measures of Process of Care 20. So there's 20 items to this measure. And the goal of the measure is really to assess family-centeredness um, in different clinics. So we used it in our clinic and we asked families to complete this questionnaire after, at the end of their clinic. So um, either the one-day clinic for those families that are more local or after the two-day clinic for more of our new patients or patients requiring really follow-up in all the different disciplines. And we also use the MPOC SP, so that stands for service providers. So it's an equivalent measure similar to the MPOC 20. However, it looks at family centeredness from the perception of our service providers. So we also asked our uh, clinicians that participate in the clinic to complete this MPOC SP measure. And so you see here that 58 of our participants, of our families completed the measure and 20 of those uh, did a follow-up questionnaire a year, about on average a year later. And what we show here is that the scoring for these two questionnaires is based on a seven point scale. One means not at all. So the person really disagrees with the statement and it, the higher score is seven. And that means to a very great extent. So what this means is that the highest maximum score can be seven, the lowest can be one, and higher scores denote greater family centeredness. So overall, we see that our scores are quite high. Um, so five, six, and that denotes uh, to a high extent uh, family centeredness. We do see that there's not really a statistically significant change between the two time points. And we do see that our lowest scores is uh, around providing general information. So the scores are overall high. However, the lowest score is on providing general information. For the service providers, there were seven of those, and those included our rehab team, our doctors, the nurses. We see that the scores are much lower. And that's not surprising. Many studies report similar findings in different clinics, different populations, that service providers tend to be more critical of the care they provide. So that shows a good potential for wanting to improve. Um, however, we see from the parents that there was a high level of satisfaction. And we do see that in both, uh, both measures, some of the lower scores were around, again, providing general information to families. So providing more information to the families and the highest scores are really around uh, providing respectful and supportive care. Um, so both uh, stakeholder groups reported higher scores in those areas. The next project I'd like to share is uh, our telerehabilitation home exercise program. And that pro uh, project received uh, pilot grant funding from the Canadian Musculoskeletal Rehab Research Network, funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And so we published the protocol paper uh, very recently, and we have here a picture of our physical therapist and one of our occupational therapists, um, you know, trying out a session with our, uh, with my master's student, Marianne Gagnon, actually with her sister here. So Marianne, uh, this was her master's uh, thesis, and I co-supervised Marianne with my colleague, Louis Nicolas. And so a little bit about this project. Um, really what we found out from our previous activities, talking to patients and families and asking them, what are their priorities? So having a exercise program came up as one of, um, one of the important priorities that youth and families had. And so this was the perfect opportunity to start this project. And so what we do is that 
there's an initial assessment provided by an occupational therapist and a physical therapist at the same time. And then um, during this initial assessment, range of motion is measured, uh, functional ability, uh, the goals, the, patient, the participants are asked to provide goals using a measure called the Goal Assess Attainment Scale. And there are a few questionnaires done uh, electronically as well, and those include the PAQ, which is the Physical Activity Questionnaire for Adolescents, the APPT, which is a pain questionnaire, and the POTC, which is developed by the American Academy of Orthopedic uh, Surgeons, and that really looks at function in different dimensions um, for uh, children that have had a, an orthopedic condition or intervention. So following this initial assessment, our uh, physical rehabilitation technician takes all this information and the participant's goal and develops an individualized home exercise program that she then provides to the participant. Now, I just wanna clarify that all these different meetings are done remotely. So there's no actual face-to-face -face exchange from the initial assessment to the final assessment. Everything is done virtually. And we had participants mostly doing from their own home we had one of our participants doing from school as well. And so the program, we asked for participants to do their home exercise program for 12 weeks. We asked them to do their exercises between two to three times a week. Of course, if they'd like, they can do them uh, more, more frequently, and for about 15 to 30 minutes per time. Um, and so at the end, we, re, we, we administered again those measures. And so the goal of this pro project was really to see if it was feasible to use remote connections and assess, deliver, and provide a home exercise program to youth between the ages of 11 and 21 years of age in Canada um, for this home exercise program. And so I'm showing you here our seven participants that completed the study. The study ran a course of about one year. So we were funded to do this as a pilot project. And we see that we have uh, participants from different regions in Canada, some that are quite close. So the distance here in the middle column is the distance from their home to our hospital in Montreal. And so you see that some participants were quite far. And uh, of course, we had one local in Quebec that was quite close to actually. And um, the goals of the patients were around managing pain, improving endurance, improving manual dexterity, um, again, reducing pain, um, improving transfers, um, self-feeding with less compensatory techniques, propelling their wheelchair better. And so what we wanted to look here was, is, it, is this project feasible? Can we deliver this home exercise program remotely? And so Marianne came up with different parameters to look at feasibility, which in included recruitment rates, withdrawal rates, which means patients that have started the intervention, that have actually consented to do the intervention, but that never started. So that's this first withdrawal rate here. The second withdrawal rate is those that have consented and that have started the intervention, but that withdrew during the intervention. We looked at completion rates, so percentage or proportion of youth that actually completed the program, compliance, and um, as well as non-compliance to the to the tele-rehab meetings. And we have here the operational, I, operationalization, so how we really operationalized, how we measured those different parameters. So in red, we see here that the only result that was not attained, um, that was a recruitment rate, which we defined as having 50% or more of our eligible and reachable participants agree to participate, we show here that we had a bit below 40% of our recruitment rate. So we did not achieve that. Uh, we do see for the rest, for the most part, that we did achieve quite close or either, um, no, we, we actually did really reach all those other parameters. And so we're really uh, excited about that. And those uh, findings are promising and demonstrate that this uh, mode of delivery is, uh, is feasible. Now, just for some um, preliminary data, so uh, the student is still very much analyzing the data, but I thought we would share some of the data. So this is looking at, in Burgundy here, the pre-results uh, on the physical activity questionnaire, and then in turquoise, you have the post-results, so the results at the end of the intervention. And here we have our seven participants um, here. 
And so we see that for the most part, the scores on the physical activity questionnaire did not uh, move too much. Um, we have to remember that the, pro that the program was really geared at doing home exercises in the house and not really going into the community and really augmenting the level of exercise. We do see here a significant increase um, for our last participant here. So that's exciting too. And here we're using the POTSI and one of uh, the six dimensions of the POTSI, specifically the global functioning score. Again, for some of the participants, we don't see a big change. Uh, here for participant four and participant seven, we do see a quite a significant increase. Um, I do have to mention that there is a decrease here for participant six. The reason being that this youth actually um, hurt his ankle, uh, not due to the home exercise program, but uh, a week before having the last assessment, the final assessment. So that did bring the scores down. So overall, we see that, there, um, that, that this project was feasible. My third, uh, the third project that I'd like to share with you is our uh, registry for children with arthrogryposis. And so this pro project is funded by a four-year clinical multi-site Shriners uh, grant. And um, I'm going to first talk about very briefly our pilot registry, which we completed in 2018. That was a two-year project. And we published the protocol as well, of the, as well as the findings. And you can see here a team of researchers that were part of this pilot project at the Shriners in Montreal, and we partnered with uh, Shriners in Philadelphia. And the pilot phase included um, really uh, working with our experts and uh, having a content validity exercise and piloting the data with uh, 40 youth uh, between birth and 21 years of age to, to really look over our data and be able to make sure that the data is really capturing what we want it to capture. So this is an infographic that is showing um, the results of our pilot in a more uh, accessible manner. And so what we see here is that um, on average in our 40 families from our uh, parent report, um, 14 days was the average hospital stay for our newborns. So for our, the children that were included in this registry, when they were born, they uh, stayed in the hospital on average 14 days. And the reasons were varied, but usually included either extra time for diagnosis, feeding and breathing difficulties, jaundice, um, some had fractures, as well as early interventions. Um, again, from our parent report, uh, only uh, slightly above, but really close to half of our participants reported that um, arthrogryposis was detected in utero. And we see here on the right um, for our 40 children, how their uh, different parts of the body from the musculoskeletal system were, were involved. So we see again that the hands and feet were very much involved. 42% um, reported involvement of the spine and about one in five had a lower jaw. We see here that involvement of other body parts, such as cardiac involvement, gastrointestinal and genital urinary was about one in five, a bit higher for a central nervous system, which is close to 30%. What we did notice uh, as well, though, is that only about half of our participants reported having had genetic testing. And among those, there was really a, a small proportion uh, for which genes were identified. Um, and so that really led us to think that we need to expand our registry and really include genetic testing, uh, more of a genetic investigation into this process. Um, what we also noticed is that, and uh, actually I learned this from exchanging at one of the AMCSI meetings in the past where I shared this pilot registry and asked the attendees in the, in the audience what they felt about the study, if, if there was an area that I hadn't thought about, if there was something uh, meaningful to them or something important that they felt we should capture in the registry. And our families that attended uh, the meetings told us that pain should be um, you know, collected as well as developmental milestones knowing 
what can be expected of babies with AMC. When do they sit? When do they roll? When do they stand? And so on. And so we added those outcomes to our expanded and uh, new registry. So this registry, as I mentioned, is funded by Shriners Grant from uh, since January 2019, and it includes for the moment four Shriners hospitals. So you have here a group in Montreal, our group in Northern California, our group in Philadelphia, and our group in Portland. We also collaborate with experts in AMC, and we have a study geneticist. And so we're very excited to have started this, uh, this registry. So I'm just gonna go over the aims of this registry. And it's really, as I said earlier, to map the phenotype with genotype, but we are collecting so much interesting and relevant information. Our first part consists of a telephone interview with the primary caregiver. We ask about maternal and paternal um, medical histories. We ask about the pregnancy. We ask about the delivery. Um, we also do uh, medical photographs to be able to really have a better understanding of how each child presents themselves. We have several standardized questionnaires and tests that we administer. That includes uh, the functional mobility scale and the functional ambulation questionnaire to look at mobility. We use the WeFIM to look at self-care and mobility and uh, social cognitive skills. We also use the PROMIS and a PAINT tool as well as the EQ5D that is a measure of quality of life. And we also look at a history of intervention. So over um, the course of life, how many and what are the different interventions that the youth uh, receive? And our last aim is really to look at genetics. So for some of our participants, and I'll go into that in, in the next slide, I believe, we do a uh, genetic test that can depend on the, on, on the family history and whether previous genetic testing was done different genetic tests can be done. And uh, we are taking blood, um, preferably, but saliva can also be taken. And so we have started this part as well. And so as I mentioned before, for a genomics section, we look at familial history. Is there a family history of contractures um, and of arthrogryposis? Does the child present atypically? So when we think of amyoplasia, there's a very typical presentation. If the child doesn't look like that, um, we can think about whether or not they've had genetic testing, whether the child has central nervous system involvement or other system involvement, and whether there's co-sanguinity, so the biological parents are related. And then we reach out to our uh, potentially eligible uh, families and explain to them this part of the study once they're registered in the registry and see if they accept or agree to participate. And ideally, we try to get a trio, which means that we try to get a sample from uh, the child as well as both biological parents. And in some cases, we can expand to other members of the family that may present with a similar uh, uh, physical presentation. So I wanted to share some um, some different um, activities that we did for our registry is initially, of course, we said, well, we must use the same definition for our participants. And so that led to really a, um, the development of a definition for AMC with a group of international experts. And that was published recently. So you see here all the different experts that came from many different countries and we included geneticists, pediatricians, neurologists, um, patient representatives as well, orthopedic surgeons, rehab uh, specialists, uh, registry experts, epidemiologists, and so on. And so that was how we defined our selection criteria with the definition that you see uh, here. And I noticed that the definition was shared in the AMC Awareness Month, so I'm so happy about that. Uh, we standardized medical photos, so we wanted to make sure that we take the same photographs across all our study sites. So we developed a um, manual, a guideline for which pictures to take for our younger participants as well as our older ones. Um, the selection of outcome measures, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, partnering with patients, uh, with youth, with families is so important. And so by attending the different AMCSI meetings in the past and hearing your voices, that really contributed um, so importantly 
to inform the decisions between what to measure in our registry. So I really want to thank you for that. Um, in order to harmonize the data collection, so to make sure that we collect the data in the same manner, and to facilitate open and timely communication among all our sites, we have monthly conference calls, we had two face-to-face -face meetings already, so we have lots of fun and it's lots of work, but it's so enjoyable and exciting. And I do have to say that due to the current pandemic, we've we have uh, modified our protocol to include now remote recruitment and data collection. So being able to recruit face-to-face -face for our clinical sites that have started uh, seeing patients again for research purposes, but for others, we are able to uh, recruit remotely um, in Montreal, for example, and uh, the other sites to follow. So the contributions of our registry are threefold. Uh, we'll be able to identify risk factors associated with the physical uh, presentation of the child. Uh, collection of all the data and the history of interventions can guide decision making to improve outcome in, in these children. And of course, we want to discover new genetic causes and molecular mechanism, and that has really exciting and tremendous potential to enhance current care as well as establish new therapies. And so I'm excited to say that at the moment we've recruited 28 uh, participants in Canada. If we calculate all our sites, we're at about 40. We do want to get to 300 um, uh, children between birth and 21 years of age. So we're, uh, we still have uh, time to continue this and get to our target. And uh, you can see here the distribution in uh, Canada. The last project that I'd like to share with you is really about uh, the co-development of um, best practice or expert guidance statements for rehabilitation. And so how we did this is that through a qualitative study, which means that we use patient interviewing, uh, we asked our youth and parents and clinicians, so three different stakeholder groups, the parents, the youth, and the clinicians, what was important to them in terms of rehabilitation. And this was one of my uh, PhD students, Caroline's uh, work with our group at the Shriners in Montreal. And what we discovered is that these are the different areas that are really important to youth, families, and, clinic and clinicians. So knowing more about pain and managing pain better, understanding more muscle and joint function and promoting that, as well as promoting uh, daily activities and mobility, encouraging participation and meaningful activities such as sports, arts, uh, employment, driving, and so on. And of course, uh, maintaining and ensuring that psychosocial well-being is addressed and maintained. And so this project is really unique uh, for us in its sense that we uh, include in the research group patient representatives um, so a, a youth uh, that is now a young adult that was a previous patient of ours at the Shriners as well as a patient representative that represents the voice of many families um, in the AMC community as well as clinicians and experts in AMC and methodological experts in the development of best practice uh, recommendations. So we're very excited for this project and we've named it DARE. So that stands for Developing Arthrogryposis Rehabilitation Expert Guidance. And we have our logo here um, that I'm happy to share with you. And so uh, what I wanna say is that I'm not gonna go over this timeline. It's a bit busy, although it is colorful, but it shows that there are different phases to this project. And so we're very much uh, going to be using expert opinion from clinicians, as well as partnering with youth and families to hear their voices as to what is important to them in order to achieve those, those uh, different areas that I just spoke to you before about in the areas of participation, pain, muscle and joint function, mobility, daily activities, as well as psychosocial well-being. And so the first step was really to appreciate what exists in the current literature. And so we already have published uh, three scoping reviews in three of those areas, and the two last ones are presently underway. We will also be sending out a survey to our clinicians uh, internationally, so worldwide, and looking at what are the current practices in the assessment and the evaluation, as well as the management of children with AMC in those different priority areas. We'll then again be uh, working very much together 
uh, with experts around the world to develop expert statements. And then we'll have a, a phase of validity where we'll have an external panel to review uh, using some guidelines that were really developed to appraise clinical guidelines. And uh, to finish off, I want to really uh, thank you for all the different initiatives that AMCSI support, Inc., as well as Misha, the international ambassador for AMC, and all of you have been sharing on social media. I want to also share with you, um, I'm sure that most of you know about our three videos that we developed um, in English. Uh, that was how we started, and we then translated to French as well as Spanish. The Spanish one was just released, so you can find it on the Shriners Hospitals for Children Montreal's YouTube channel or on social media. I know that they're posted on the AMCSI website, and I know that Misha has also shared the Spanish video uh, very recently. So this is just as a reminder to um, share knowledge, to share awareness, to get the word out about AMC and to have your voices heard. I want to thank you so much for listening. And usually at the end of this session, I ask for you, and I do ask usually throughout. So usually it's not just me talking this way, but I ask you all um, for your feedback. I ask you questions, you ask me questions. So I do appreciate this opportunity. Of course, it's not the same to see you all in person, um, but I do, I am sharing my email here. So that if you want to reach out and you have any questions, you want to hear more, you want to learn more, don't hesitate to, um, to email and I, I will try my best to help or to guide as much as, uh, as I can. And again, I want to acknowledge all our wonderful uh, collaborators and students and research staff and expert study team and all those projects and you for listening and contributing to our research. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you again and wishing you all the best. Keep safe and have a wonderful summer. Thank you.